tonight. This will be our 30th lesson in Genesis. And we're going to be in the 20th chapter. There's another one of those chapters that there's some things that there's not a lot of explanation about them. And that's something you have to learn when you're in Christ. You have to learn to live with things that God doesn't explain. This is Abraham and Abimelech, the incident with Abimelech, the, not the, is the Abimelech that was a king of Gerar, which is a Philistine territory. 20th chapter, all 18 verses. And Abraham journeyed from thence <coughs> toward the south country, that's from thence is from Mamre, toward the south country and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur, which and sojourned in Gerar. And Abram said of Sarah his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech king of Gerar sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. For the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her. And he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, she is my sister, and she, even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. God said to him in a dream, yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her, now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet. And he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know, thou, know that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. Therefore Abimelech rose early in the morning, and called all his servants, and told all these things in their ears. And the men were sore afraid. Then Abimelech called Abraham, and said unto him, What hast thou done to us, and why is have I offended thee, that thou hast brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said to Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? And Abraham said, Behold, I thought, Surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. Yet indeed she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. And it came to pass, when God caused me to wander from my father's house, that I said unto her, This is thy kindness, as thou hast shown to me, at every place whither we shall come, say of me, He is my brother. And Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants, and gave them unto Abraham, and restored him Sarah his wife. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before thee, dwell where it pleaseth thee. And unto Sarah he said, I have given thee thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, he is to thee a covering of thy eyes unto all that are with thee and with other, all other. Thus she was reproved. So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and they bare children. For the Lord had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Amen. Uh, I'm thankful for these kind of texts that are in Scripture because they provide us as an index to God. We have an, kind of an index to Him, how He regards people. <coughs> now, I wanted to say a few introductory words. This is necessary because I wanted to see this passage properly. If we're looking for some indications of the kind of God is in regard to salvation, we'll find it in here. But we've got to assess these people properly in view of the times that they were living in. Now concerning people living before the law, which was a period of 20, 2,500 years. At the time of our text, it was about 2,400 years. 
uh, 2,100 years. <coughs> God didn't talk about many people. To them, about them, or any other thing. Not many individuals. I think I've identified 20 some individuals. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, about 40 some individuals. I want to I want to name these. These are people that God talked to or had some comment made about them. There's Adam and Eve, Cain, Abel, Seth, Nimrod, Lamech, Emek, Noah, Ham, Tira, Job, Abraham, Sarah, Lot, Pharaoh, Hagar, Ishmael, Isaac, Esau, Jacob, Joseph, Joseph's brothers, Pharaoh, Moses' parents, Moses, Miriam, Pharaoh's daughter, Aaron, and Joshua. Those are the only individuals he actually talked about. Now there was the incident of Korah. We could throw Korah in there. But that was after the giving of the law. Now that's in a period of 2,100 years that's the individuals that are named in Scripture. Aside from the genealogies, in the genealogies they were named, but there was, but this is some something was said specifically to them and about them. <coughs> so we read this text. We've got to keep in mind that God just didn't talk to everybody. That's right. Amen. And there were no prophets up until the time of our text. There were no prophets. Enoch prophesied, but he, there were no one called a prophet until mm -hmm. this time. And this, during this period of time, God responded to certain transgressions. He, now, he's, remember, he's educating the world about himself. Yeah. Yeah. There's disobedience. That's Adam and Eve. So if you ever wonder, why, what, what does God think about disobedience? Well, there, there he is, lived out. Murder, there's Cain. Violence, that's the world during Noah's day. <laughs> A united effort that excludes God. There's Babel, Sodom, sodomy, mm -hmm. and the attempt to take another man's wife. And that's the only sins that I could of record that he actually dealt with. Because it was, this was not a time when extensive definitions were given or broad exposure to God was given. But see, sin had done something to the human race so that God couldn't just like unload a lot of Thing. So it, it was done slowly. Yeah. And there's some responses that, of divine favor. Not many, not many, but some. Sacrifice made by faith. God received Abel in the sacrifice. A godly life. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And believing God, Abraham's he, and that's, that's about it. Up until Abraham's day, that's about it. So there's a lot more exposure to God's view of sin than there was to God's view of righteousness. Yeah. And all of this confirms to me that the focus of these early revelations was God himself. He's building a concept of God. See, there were a lot of gods in the world, but yeah. there wasn't a lot known about these gods. Most of these gods were gods noted for their anger, and you're trying to suppress the anger of the, of the heathen gods. That was mostly what these gods were like. <coughs> He's building a, a concept that will blend well when he, when he brings a Savior into the world, you'll have a proper yeah. idea about God and why Jesus came. I'm, I'm personally convinced that it has not dawned on many, many Christians like, like why was Christ necessary? This, I don't think this has been made clear uh -huh. to people. It had to be because, see, sin had to be dealt with. Amen. God couldn't like, sweep it under the rug. And so he, he demonstrates this all through these texts. He, he lets you see him as he really is, like destroyed a whole world. Yeah. <laughs> see, some people can't receive a God like this. But this is God. See, only God who has wisdom to work in such a way as to maintain this trait but it not be a dominant trait. See, that's how great God is. 
See, in Noah's day, it looked like wrath was the dominant. But it's not the dominant trait. Yeah. But it's such a significant trait, man had to know about it. Things had to happen to be reported so people would see this. <coughs> now, what can you conclude from these things that so little was known of God and so few people were addressed by God and then the, that what he said to them was very limited in scope? First, we, the fundamental thing is to know God. That's the fundamental thing. Because when Jesus comes, he's going to destroy them that know not God. See, they didn't know anything about second coming into the world. All this. So this was not known in Abraham's day. Some people sensed it, like Job. But it hadn't been revealed. <coughs> so God, so it's important that he be understood. The fundamental thing is to know God. If that knowledge of God is like the hub that everything is connected to, then a proper concept of God has to be built. There's not a quick course on this. Brother, the Apostle Paul tells us there in Ephesians that he'll be over all, through all, and in you all. That's at right. the end. That's right. And also from him, through him, and to him are all, all things. things. That's so right. knowing him then is absolutely That's essential. Right. Amen. It's the only way, from a practical viewpoint, you can make sense out of, out of life. And that's yeah. how everything's going to end up anyway. That's right. <laughs> Now, in Genesis, Moses, that's the law and the prophets, this, this whole thing was in the context of the salvation of God, which was in the context of the purpose of God, which was in the context of the person of God. The person of God is the main thing. The purpose is an expression of the purpose of God, which defines the salvation of God, which is foreshadowed with small glimpses in Moses and the prophets. Amen. That's how the thing works. And we're seeing now, we're, we're not even to Moses yet. We're just in the Genesis phase of things. See, there are c contradicting theological ideas about God that exist. They exist because somebody doesn't understand God. That's why they exist. At the root of every false teaching or wrong emphasis is, a, is ignorance of God. That's at the root of the matter. And God, if people pay attention to what God has written and what he has had inspired to be written, they'll build a proper concept of God. But if they read the Bible with a mind to find out what they want to justify, they'll miss all of this. <laughs> If the revelation of God's person is missed in Genesis, people will not comprehend salvation. John the Baptist won't make any sense, and Jesus' ministry won't make any sense. That's just the way it is. So in order for men to have uh, free access to God, which is the ultimate aim God has in mind, the matter of sin has got to be resolved. It has to be. If this is true, then God's association with man, until that happens, will always be initiated by God. And up to this point in Genesis, nobody had any contact with God to whom God didn't first contact them. Every place through that we've come across so far. The reason this is, is because there's a gap between God and man, so men can't Men can't reach up to God. They can make an effort, and they should make an effort. But until this sin thing was resolved, it, it, God had to come down to them, so to speak, and so he did. Now, it's a display of gross ignorance for men who are living in the greater light to look down upon and criticize those living in the lesser light. I mean, when you realize what a handicap they had, and how little was God, how little God divulged to them, it was that they, God didn't divulge very much of Himself. So thus far, to this point, the most He's divulged to anybody's been to Abraham. I am thy 
sealed in that exceeding great reward. I am God Almighty. He didn't tell anybody else that. And we're talking about a period of 2,000, 2000 years. So God, so to criticize those who didn't have this knowledge available to them, we should be not, not do it. In fact, most of the critics in our day, their knowledge of God is behind Abraham, not ahead of, ahead of him. Now, having said those indirect remarks, Abraham sojourned in Gerar. Now, at this time, he was what is earlier defined as walking through the land. That's what Abraham's in the process of doing. He's in the process of surveying the land that's been promised to him. And now he comes down to the southern tip to Gerar. It was near Beersheba, which is at the southmost part of the promised land. That's where you get the phrase, and Dan was the northernmost part. So you, this phrase is mentioned in Scripture several times, from Dan to Beersheba. That means from the top of the land to the bottom of the land. And Abraham's walking through this territory. Now, Gerar was a Philistine territory. It bordered the Mediterranean Sea, and they never, Israel never really conquered that area. In fact, it, it is written in the book of Joshua that they, they still hadn't conquered that land. And Jewish history notes them as continual enemies of God that reached its apex during the time of Samson. Remember, Samson and the Philistines were dominant at that time. So this is part of the land now God promised to Abram. Abraham, Abraham, and yet in the it was one of the final parts that was anywhere near conquered. Very difficult. <laughs> now, now, with this in mind, we give we go to the book of Hebrews. It's going to give us a snapshot of this period of time when he, Abraham's walking through the land. It includes our text here, but he just here's how it's stated. By faith he sojourned in the land of promises in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. See, now that covered, but was not limited to, the, our text. This is how the Holy Spirit reviewed it. He walked through the land, even though he was a potential promised owner of it as a strange land. He was walked through it. Now you've got to be able to kind of make the connections between this and and your life in Christ Jesus. <laughs> Stephen said of this period of time that we're covering in our text, he gave him none inheritance and it knows not so much as to set his foot on for he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him even as yet when as yet he had no child. So that was during this time. So he's living by faith without any real substance. <laughs> yet he's living by faith, walking through the land, viewing it from the standpoint of I'm going to inherit this, this land. Now, a lesson is to be learned here. Much of our pilgrimage in this world is spent walking through the spiritual territory we've been given. We're kind of walking through and seeing what God has provided for us, getting the first fruits of it now. That's much of our life right now. That's what it is. We're walking through the land like Abraham was. We're sojourning in the land, <coughs> exploring the domain of justification. It's like a country, you know. <laughs> and uh, exploring the sanctification, what all that involves. And, some of the all things that God has given us in Christ Jesus. Now the nature of the walk of faith is made known in Abraham's experience. It's a time when much takes place. It's by no means a boring journey. There's tests. There's trials. There's blessings. There's danger. There's safety. See, there's all of these things are part of... There's a famine. There's when you have to extend yourself to find something to eat. All of this characterizes the faith life, what it's really like. There may even be judgments during this time that a person's exposed to. <coughs> now, there's an element of uncertainty that characterizes the faith life. We really don't know what a day will bring forth. That's right. We don't know. We don't know what tomorrow holds. See, there's a, so there's an element of 
uncertainty about the whole thing. But faith is not uncertain, but a circumstance is uncertain. So Abraham's things included a famine, his wife being taken by another, the need to aggressively rescue Lot and his family, facing becoming a father at 100 years of age, contention in the home, long journeys, not having enough room, this is all faced during his pilgrimage. See, this is to help interpret. <laughs> this helps to interpret, see our own our own lives. So why should those in Christ expect a trouble-free life when our father, Abraham, he's a father of the faithful, he, there he is, lived out to you. It was anything but boring, wasn't it? <laughs> now Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she's my sister. If he said, I don't know if he said this directly to Abimelech or Abimelech heard it, but the action was Abimelech sent and took her. And flesh thinks this way. Just took her. Even if she was his sister. He thought, he thought she's in my territory, I can take her. This is, this is how Satan thinks now. This is how Satan thinks. You've got to really see this. When you're in his territory, he'll just take you. That's just what happens. You venture over into his territory, and you got danger. Sometimes you may have to go in there to rescue somebody, but see, you got to do be sober. If you if you head on straight, so to speak, when you go in there to pull somebody out of the fire, you have to be cautious, very cautious, as you yourself are deceived. <coughs> Now many uh, contemporary preachers and teachers have pointed a finger of accusation at Abraham saying how little faith he had. And look how he spoke. But see, I want to look into this a little further because I, I don't want to criticize Abraham after what God said about him because God never criticized him, so like, how could I? If God didn't. Because this goes for any person of scriptural record. If God didn't criticize them, like it doesn't mean that men are free to criticize them. Amen. Doesn't mean they were. They, it doesn't mean that they were spotless before God. But it means this is how God wants them to be known. Yes, right. Don't you dare present another picture yes, of a saint of God that God hasn't presented. Amen. Don't take a man like Joseph, who has nothing against him, or Daniel, who has nothing against him. Or Abraham was nothing against him, and then bring up things against him. That's not how God wants them to be remembered. So the record is on purpose, see, to teach this. <coughs> There's no need to philosophize about the text. We just have to work with what we have, and you can't go any further. So, like, how? What's going to happen? Abimelech comes and takes Sarah. Now see a contemporary would say, there you are, Abraham. If you hadn't have said she was his sister, he wouldn't have done that. Well, how, well, how do you know he wouldn't have done that? Yeah. How exactly do people know that? What, what was God's response? Oh, God responded by coming to Abimelech. God didn't go to Abraham. Uh -huh. Amen. God went to Abimelech. Uh -huh. God didn't go to Sarah. Yeah, right. God went to Abimelech. This is how God thought about the matter. Yes. <coughs> now the word is said, but Abimelech did not come near her. <coughs> Some of the other versions are too crude, but I'll, I'll tell you what they, how they read. Well, the NIV was, had not gone near her. New Revised Standard says, has not approached her. The Douay version said, did not touched her. The Living Bible says, hadn't slept with her yet. Sent, new, sent, new, uh, contemporary English version says, Abimelech said, I haven't slept with Sarah. And the English Revised Version of Message Bible says, he had not yet slept with Sarah. Well, see, there's no way that the words used here can be translated that way. That's, right. That's an interpretation of the text, Amen. not a translation of the text. The interpretation of the text, the words used, means exactly what it says, he didn't come near her. And it is stated modestly. See, when it comes to matters of human intimacy, God speaks with great modesty. Because crude speech awakens crude thoughts. 
Right. Now let me give you an example of this. The way the Bible speaks about sodomy. I mm -hmm. <coughs> notice some examples. Jude speaks about referring to this sin strange flesh. Here's how Paul said in Romans 1.28, sins that are not convenient. Mm -hmm. yeah. Romans 1.26 says it's against nature. 1 <laughs> Corinthians 6.9 says effeminate and abusers of themselves with mankind. And 1 Timothy 1.9 says them that defile themselves with mankind. See how, see how modest the... This is a good practice to get into. When you sometimes you have to speak about some of these things, you have to say something about them, but speak modestly about them, so you don't awaken things. Even the word adultery is in that category. See, that's even a, adultery. It speaks of it in a modest way, though the sin is not modest, but the way it's referred to is, because that's words have a way to awaken good thoughts or bad thoughts. The words you use. <coughs> now, I do not appreciate the liberal interpretation of touched her, slept with her. The word translated means come near. The literal means come or approach or enter into it. He went and never went into her private quarters is the idea. Doesn't mean they didn't sit at the same table. He didn't go into her private quarters. Now this is a commentary of the Holy Spirit. See, this is being written about 500 years after it happened. Moses has recorded this. So this is an edited yeah. commentary. By the Holy Spirit has edited how it's, how it's written down. Now this is the Bimelot. He's talking to God. God appeared to him in a dream, said, you're a dead man. Mm -hmm. Why well, that get your attention? And he said, Lord, wilt thou also slay a righteous nation? Was Philistia a righteous nation? Well, you've got to realize what he's saying here. A blameless nation. I don't question. This is probably spoken against the backdrop of Sodom and Gomorrah. This is in the area where they could have seen that the Holocaust that took place in Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. It was known what they were noted for. So righteous nation was probably in comparison to... Sodom and Gomorrah. Their iniquity wasn't full. You might say, like the Amorites, was not full. Well, they were, they were not a virtuous people. They were not in a state like Sodom and Gomorrah. And some cities weren't destroyed. So it appears as though Abimelech thought it's because they were righteous. You know, he says, are you going to destroy a righteous nation? He continued, <coughs> he continued, he said, she said uh, she was his sister. He said she was his sister, and she herself said, he's my brother. So both Abraham and Sarah told Abimelech this. And so Abimelech proceeded to take Sarah for himself. Now actually, this is kind of a remarkable occurrence, actually. Here's a Philistine king who worshiped another god, confronted by the living God, and he knows it, and he reasons with God. This is this is uh this is quite amazing. <laughs> yeah, how could this happen? Well, God's able to make you know who you're talking to. God can do this. And he tells God now, in the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. Other versions said that he had with a clear conscience, clean hands, upright heart. My heart's been pure, my hands innocent. See, I, I, was, I was not motivated except by right motives. I thought this was right. Now, it's important to understand the doctrine of Scripture <coughs> concerning flesh, which is, I know that in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. It's important to know that doctrine. That does not mean that a person outside of Christ cannot have integrity. That isn't what that means. God's going to confirm this later. In my flesh dwelleth no good things. It's important to see what this means. 
This means in relation to God. This doesn't mean in more, just in moral behavior. This doesn't mean that a person outside of Christ can't pray or be properly motivated like, say, Cornelius was. It doesn't mean a person outside of Christ could not do by nature the things contained in the law. As Romans 2.14 says, it doesn't mean that a person outside of Christ cannot live in all good conscience, as Paul did when he was outside of Christ. <laughs> but none of these conditions can justify a man, which is the point of Romans 7.18. None of them can justify a person. No flesh can do something that will offset their sin or compensate for their disobedience. Only God can take away sin. It can't be removed any other way. So it would seem that those things that you just listed are like preparation. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. For, yeah. a, for fully awakening Amen. the conscience. Amen. It's a testimony that the conscience is there. Amen. Yeah. Whatever a person may do, or however noble it may appear, if he does not engage in a conscientious effort to find the Lord... Nothing else that he does is of any lasting worth. We know this because God has ordained that every soul should seek the Lord if happily they might find him. Yeah. For it be not far from every one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. But that's different than what Abimelech is saying. That's, yeah. that's what I'm drawing out here. I don't believe that this distinction is known by what I call the church public. Uh -huh. I don't. Uh, I don't think this is known, and this is this is very low ground we're on here, relatively speaking. <coughs> now God doesn't say, "Oh, wait a minute." I know your heart, Abimelech. Here's what God said: I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart. So he, Abimelech said the truth. Okay. I see you gotta know how to reason like when you talk to people, you have to uh -huh. <laughs> You can say, You can't do anything. You can you can talk like that, but see, but that's that's not the whole story. Yeah. If you're talking about obtaining salvation or obtaining justification or obtaining acceptance by God, then that's another matter. But if you're just talking about morality, listen, there's a lot of very, very moral people yeah. uh -huh. that aren't justified. Yeah. Just like Abimelech wasn't. I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart. God knows the heart saves. You can sound a sense that Abimelech was withdrew from lying to God. He wouldn't. He kind of sensed he couldn't do this before God. God said to him in a dream, and I, I gather this was the same dream, not a separate one. I know you did this in the integrity of your heart. I know. Now, if you're sensitive, this all hinges on how sensitive a person's heart is. Sometimes you will say things to the Lord, and you'll tell him things, and you can almost sense in your heart, he said, I know, I know. I know, I know it's a bad situation. I know, I know this. I know you're doing the best you can. I know this. I know this. I know this. But then he explains it further to Abimelech. He says, I withheld thee. Yeah, amen. <laughs> now, I don't know what a person who is an advocate of free moral agency and all of that, how they handle this, but this, <laughs> I withheld thee. I didn't let you do this. Yeah. That proves that what Solomon said is true. The king's heart is in the hands of the Lord, and he turns it like the river of water. See, I don't know whether Sarah looked like he didn't want Sarah or maybe his attention was drawn to somebody else. or I, I don't know what drove this, but God didn't let him touch her. Amen. You know, sometimes, particularly young people, they'll, they'll escape some kind of a circumstance and they kind of marvel at it. When they look back on it, they kind of... Mm -hmm. God didn't let that person do that. Yes. That's how you had to look at it. Yes. You say, well, what if he did? Well, that, that, give thanks for what he didn't. Mm -hmm. yes. Withheld him. 
Now let's think of the association of God with men's hearts. God can make a heart obstinate. That's Deuteronomy 2.30. So that Sion wouldn't let the Israelites pass through his land, even though they, they asked him if they could pass through and said they wouldn't damage the fields or anything. He wouldn't take anything. He wouldn't let them up because God made his heart obstinate. God can harden a man's heart. God can make the hearts of men fat so they have no spiritual sensibility. God can give a man a new heart. He can write his law upon the heart. He can put his fear into the heart. He can put wisdom into a person's heart. <laughs> God can put in a king's heart to desire to beautify the house of the Lord. God put into Nehemiah's heart to repair the walls. God put into Nehemiah's heart to gather the people to reckon a genealogy among them. God can put gladness into the heart. Huh? Psalm 4, 7. God can put earnest care into a person's heart. God can put into men's hearts to give their kingdom to the beast. Yeah, that's right. Revelation 17, 17. See, God has control over the heart. Amen. The heart is the center of your yeah. person but it's not the center of God's... God doesn't build around your heart. Amen. He builds around you His purpose. Amen. Important to see that. <laughs> the given is, it's, if a person knows this about God, that he can direct his prayers in such a way that he can ask God to incline others' hearts in That's the right, right way. In his own, too. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So now God, after saying this to him, said, Restore the man his wife. Give his wife back. See, there are some wrongs that can't be corrected or undone. You can't, the fact that you took her, can't, you can't, can't undo that. Yeah. Give her back. Abimelech could not keep Sarah in his house, promising never to come near her. Huh? Yeah, that's right. Oh, no. Give her back. Some people, they... Keep the stuff that made them sin and promise God they won't let it lead them astray anymore. Oh, this is not wise. Get it out of the house. Amen. Get rid of it. Restore, restore your heart to God completely. Amen. This aspect of the divine nature is some, has kind of been hidden in our day. People continue to remain in circumstances that are wrong, thinking they can control them. In fact, I had kind of been, oh, in about 1970, during our evening service, a family came in. He had about eight children, a whole slew of children. And they came in, and uh, I asked them to introduce themselves when they did, and they had different last names. So, well, it's probably a sister or somebody like that. So afterward, I asked him to stay. I wanted to talk with him. I said, I, I'm not prying, but I noticed that you had different last names. He said, Pastor, that's something i got to talk to you about. We aren't married. We're both actually married to somebody else, and we're not divorced from them. So we're, we're married to somebody else. We're living together. And half these kids are hers and half are mine. What should we do? Well, I said, you got to separate tonight. Got to make the best of the man and do it tonight. But so and so, you can't come back here till you do this. He said, why? I said, you notice the neighborhood we're in here? They know everything goes on in this congregation. Somebody out here, because he's from the area, somebody out here probably knows you. And you may tell them, like he told me, she lives at one end of the house and I live at the other. You know, and that's so that. He said, maybe you could convince me of that, but you couldn't convince them of that. This is a serious enough matter. You've got to resolve this thing right away. So he did, he determined to resolve it. But he didn't. And the reason was they went to a next Sunday to a charismatic church. 
He got the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And he thought, and he told me this personally, he thought, if God did that for me, then this can't be wrong that I'm doing. I thank the Lord that doesn't happen all the time. But See, there's some things you've got to take a stand, just like God did here. Restore her. Here's what he said. If you don't, you'll die. That's what God, that's what God said. <laughs> Restore the man and his wife. He said, for, he's a liar. Ah, that's what men said. That, now, this is what men say. That's right. Abraham lied. That's not what God said. God said, he's a prophet. Yes. Amen. That's what he said. Yeah. Amen. He's a prophet. Mm -hmm. That is the first time that word is mentioned in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Prophet. Mm -hmm. First time that is mentioned. He's a prophet. <coughs> Yet we don't have any prophecy that he gave. How could you call Abraham a prophet? In what sense was he a prophet? Well, he was God's appointed prophet for generations to come to announce to them what God was going to do. I'll name some of the things that he was told. All families of the earth would be blessed in him. The seed of Abraham would be as numerous as the dust of the earth and stars of the heaven. The land of Canaan would be given to Abraham and his seed. His seed would be strangers in the land that was not theirs and would be afflicted 400 years. God would judge the nation that afflicted them and they'd come out with great substance. His seed would come out, with afflict, come out of the afflicted nation in the fourth generation. The borders of the promised land were defined. The nations that were dispossessed were defined. The nations and kings, that nations and kings would come from Abraham was promised. That God would establish a covenant with Abraham and his seed. That God would be their God. The covenant of circumcision was to be kept. His covenant was established through Isaac and his progeny. And Abraham's seed would possess the gate of their enemies. Now, God intended that all of that be passed down from generation to generation. So that some years later, four to five hundred years later, when they're in Egypt, Moses would remember this, Joseph would remember this, because it was he was faithful. Amen. He was a prophet. He was a prophet. Those are all, see, a prophet can only tell what God's told him. Yeah, that's right. So he is... That's what he was a prophet of. And he was faithful to do this. <coughs> That's what God said. I know him. I know him. He'll command his children and his household after him. They'll keep the way of the Lord and do justice and judgment. Now how difficult is it for that kind of faithfulness to occur? Well, it is very difficult. There were large gaps of time in Israel when they... Nobody knew these things. For a long time, without a priest, one prophet says, during the time of Josiah, there for a long time, people didn't know about the Word of God. For a long time. And they found the, the Word of God in the house of God. Nobody knew what it meant. They read it. Hilkiah, the priest, read it verbatim, just read it. King Josiah said, Whoa, we're in big trouble. We, we, we have been doing what God said. See, the people, it got away from the people. I'm pointing out what a remarkable thing it is that this thing was kept alive yeah. <laughs> until, until the time of Moses. Because there were just a few hundred years, it, it lapsed away. People yeah. did, didn't know it. And this happened frequently. <laughs> this happened frequently in Israel's history. And the similar thing has taken place in our time. A similar thing has taken place. Under the watch of a professionalized clergy, the word of God has been largely removed from human thought. Right. Amen. I was speaking to my brother-in-law about this. <coughs> I told him that I have a dictionary that uh, is an unabridged Oxford dictionary dating back to the late 1800s, early 1900s. There is not a Bible word, key word, or a person of the Bible, or a city of the Bible, or a race of the Bible that's not in that dictionary. You can't find any. It's in that dictionary. Why? That's how the people talked. 
It's not in any dictionary today. In fact, that you have a spell checker on your word processor, every time you type a Bible name in, it says misspelled. Hmm? Why? Because the people don't talk in Bible language. That's why. That's what a degeneration has taken place. This has taken place during the reign of a professionalized clergy and more religious education than the world's ever known. It's happened. Course at ARM last week when I mentioned during our scripture time, Lot. He broke in, raised hand. Who's Lot anyway? Now, this is a man my age. Yes. He'd never heard. Yeah, there you are. Never. I know that there are some people that haven't been exposed to scripture and so forth, but he's a pretty prominent individual That's in the right. book of Genesis. That's a perfect example of what we're yeah. talking about. Then this highlights, see. How remarkable it was that Abraham kept these things alive. He's a prophet. Now, now he'll pray for you. That's the first time prayer is mentioned in the Bible. There's no mention of anybody praying before Abraham. The word prayer isn't used. Pray isn't used. Prayerful isn't used. Praying isn't used. First time right here. First time. Now that is written in Scripture, they called on the name of the Lord, and what, what all that involved, it never tells you exactly what that was, whether it was a, an action or whether it was in words, it doesn't, doesn't tell you. All of this again, <coughs> he'll pray for you. He didn't say that liar will pray for you. <laughs> I don't think God would let a liar pray to him, for someone else particularly. He'll pray for you. Prayers of Abraham were apparently the only thing that stood between Abimelech and divine judgment. Yes, amen. That was it. And if thou restore her not, he says, if thou restore her not, thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. So everybody in your house is going to die. Wife, maidens, servants, governors, politicians, they're all going to die. You don't do this. If thou restore her not. <coughs> Well, how's Abimelech going to react to that? Well, he rises early in the morning and called all his servants. He called for a gathering of all the mines. Early in the morning, in Scripture, when it says that it, the morning officially started at 6 a.m., early in the morning means before the sun rose. It was yet dark. Well, it was yet dark. Some place says rose early in the morning before, before a light of day. It, it will specify. So he rose up real early. Yeah. Well, it was still dark. And they brought everybody together. They were obedient. They came early in the morning or not. And he told them all these words. Here we, here's some words I got now. See, this is serious now, folks. Don't anyone fall asleep while we're talking here because what we're talking to here can... It's going to mean that either everyone here is going to die or I'm going to have to do what God said to do. Called the servants. <coughs> told them all these words. Oh, how are the people going to respond? Oh, come on, Abimelech. Is that what they said? No. The men were sore afraid. Mm -hmm. Frightened them. See, in that primitive time, there was actually more of an awareness of God than there is in the 21st century of our day. Amen. Right. Yeah. Amen. There's all kind of warnings that are sounded, being sounded from pulpits and from P individuals' mouths, and they're not making the people shake. They're not fearing when they hear them. They were exceedingly afraid. Yes. Interesting to note between you talked about the back of the Sam and Gomorrah earlier that now they didn't really have that, that type of warning. But these people That's right. they have their warning like, oh, we're getting warning. That's, That's right, amen. Amen. <laughs> amen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now there's some there's warnings issued in scripture. I'll read a few of them here. And you see if they make people tremble or fear. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, he that believeth not shall be damned. If any man defile the temple of God, him will God destroy. 
And you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Marriage is honorable and all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Now, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. The fearful, unbelieving, the abominable murderers, the whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire that burnt, burnt lake of lake that burns with fire and brimstone. Now, some people can hear that and it just they don't fear. They just say, that sounds an awful negative. Yeah. Yeah. We wish there wasn't so much negative. See? Yeah. This tells you something about the time. It tells you how sin has drugged the human race down. Yes, that even these old Philistines, well, they, boy, they, they, we're going to have to do something about this. Then Abimelech, he calls Abraham. He's understandably upset. Said, well, what hast thou done in, unto us? <laughs> what have I, what have I, and what have I offended thee? Why, why did you do this to me? That thou hast brought this, brought on me and my kingdom a great sin. Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. And then, like said to Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? What, 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 when you come into our country, what prompted you to think like this? Yeah, yeah. Abimelech had taken Abraham at his word. Now he asked for Abraham to explain it. Will Abraham tell the truth? Is Abraham really a liar? How is he going to answer this? Well, he tells the truth. He tells, he tells them exactly the truth as we're going to see. Now it's likely that when God is working in a person, quite often he'll have to give some explanations for his conduct <laughs> to somebody. It'll come up. It'll come up. Why? You have to give an explanation for it. You'll have to, Abraham gave it in, light, in the light of what he knew, but you've got to give it in light of what, yeah. what you can know. Yeah. Amen. I want to draw attention before I go further here to the limitation of being ignorant of the will of God. How, how a person is limited when they don't know the will of God. Uh, God. Abraham didn't know anything about God's will in relative, relative to salvation and reconciliation, justification, the world to come. He didn't know anything about that. All he knew pertained to this country and his offspring living there, and the whole world being blessed because of his seed, and that was kind of vague. He didn't know all these things, so he's not going to think like you, th like you would think. That's right. So you would think differently under these circumstances because of you're in a greater light. Mm -hmm. He wasn't in a greater light. He couldn't think that way. <coughs> now God did say to him one time, I am thy shield. Mm -hmm. See, there you are. Why, why didn't Abraham believe that? Well... How come the light had day star? How come the light had to dawn on you, yeah, that's right. and the day star had to rise in your heart about things you'd been exposed to for a long time, and you couldn't see them, and all of a sudden you begin to see them. You got to give Abraham that kind of latitude too. Yeah, that's right. What it meant to be a shield, it hadn't dawned on Abraham, yeah. but it, it will dawn on him. Yeah. But it hadn't dawned on me. So see, we've got to give him the same amount of liberty we give our, we give ourselves, we give ourselves time to grow up. Abraham told him the truth. He said, "Well, here's what I thought when he came into Philistia. I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place. They're going to kill me because of Sarah, so they can get Sarah. What a sensitivity that is." He come into this territory. Well, actually, this uh, this is true of the whole land of Canaan at the time, but it seemed to be especially true of Philistia. Yeah. Come in here, and he sensed the fear of God's not here. Yeah, yeah. No fear of God here. Yeah, you've been in places like that, yeah. where you come in, you say the fear of God's not in this place. Yeah. You've been places like that, I know. It's good to think about it and to ponder it. Do not let that escape you. Then, if you sense that, then you proceed with 
caution. <laughs> Ideally speaking, we acknowledge that it would have been better to have sought the Lord in the matter. But there's no record in Scripture up to this time of anybody initiating contact with God. No, nobody, to our knowledge, did this. Everybody responded to God, but they didn't initiate, come to God with a petition, unless God had come to them first. Like Abraham reasoned, if there be 50 righteous, a God first. So that, that's not the case here. So for him to petition God, this would be like a first. <laughs> so I can understand why he, uh, why he didn't. And indeed, he said, indeed, I didn't, I didn't, it's not totally false that she's my sister. She is my sister. She's the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. Now, the people, when I say the commentators, I'm not just speaking of like 20th century commentators. People that are, had a track record of having a knowledge of the scripture and a working knowledge of the scripture, they have all had a variety of explanations of this text, and I gave you some, not, not because this explains the text, but I'm going to make a point of why I did this. They all had different approaches and different explanations. Some of them will appeal to you and some of them won't. But this accents this condition. Godly men who know the scripture and can integrate scripture pretty well can't arrive at a satisfactory conclusion. All of this accents the necessity of teaching being built around divine affirmations not what men said they think the affirmation meant. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is very important mm -hmm. when it comes to preaching and teaching. Yeah. It's not to say that godly men can't have a view of a text or that they should avoid a view of the text, but they should not make that the basis mm -hmm. of their preaching and teaching. Yeah. They want to say something about that, so I make sure mm -hmm. that you precede it by saying this is how I think you may be absolutely right, yeah. Yeah. but you, even if you are, it, it's it's got to be based on what God said, right. not what you thought. So these men, see, they all they all finally admit we, it's, we don't under it, God didn't tell us the reasons why. So then that means it's like a, you're on a dead end road. Yeah. If you're trying to figure out what God meant and God didn't tell you what He meant, you're on a dead end road. Yeah. At some point, you're going to have to stop. So it's just as well to stop at the front end. You're going to waste in your time. Because if you do reach a conclusion, you can't trust in it. Yeah, that's right. You can't depend on it. <coughs> then he, he talks about how God led him, and, but how he said it is interesting to me. And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house. It's interesting how he said that, isn't it? He didn't say when he called me to leave my father's house, which is what the text says. He caused me to wander from my house. Even though he did it, so to speak, of his own accord, as he didn't think that he was the instigator of it, God caused me to wander from my father's house. Now this refers to God's call. Now here's, here's the text about the call. The Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I show thee. Now why would God, why would Abraham say God caused him? Because that's how serious Abraham took God's word. Amen. That's right. When God said to do it, it was just the same as if he picked him up by the nap of the neck and moved him out. He did it. And he did it because of what God said, yes. His strong faith too. That that's he, right. That he knew that God was uh, calling that's him right. to do that. That's uh right. -huh. <laughs> yeah, technically it was his faith that moved him out. But it, but he traced he traced it all, he continued to trace it back to to God. Brother Gibbon, he could continue to stay there. That's right. Maybe That's he knew right. God called him out. Uh -huh. Now this you have to check your own conscience and heart on things like this. But when it comes to you that you ought to do this or that, God requires you this or that. What you do will tell you a lot about you. A lot about you. 
Wander. What does it mean to wander? It doesn't mean aimless like wander. Aimless. That doesn't mean wander aimlessly. It means no certain dwelling place. He didn't. He didn't settle down any place. He just. He was a pilgrim and a stranger. Is how we would Amen. say it. God thrust. He'd been living in a situated, situated in a given place for some time. He was 70, 75, 70 to 75, and up until then he'd been living in one place. But all of a sudden he had to move out, and he didn't know where he was going. But he had to keep on the move. <laughs> Because God's going to direct him while he's on the move. It's just like you. See, God directs you when you're on the move. When you're making progress, that's when God directs you. Now, you can say God caused me to live like this. You could say that with be just as true as what Abraham said. In his wandering, <coughs> Abraham had to keep on the move to get the next message. <laughs> Amen. This posture is referred to as Sojourning yeah. is more than interesting that God refers to this as God causing him. This is not a complaint. <laughs> this is an explanation. Abraham wants Abimelech to know, I've been wandering around here because of what God said. It's not just that I can't find a satisfactory place. I mean, it isn't that. I've been, uh, I'm walking through the land, what I'm doing. And as I have mentioned, this is a parallel to our life in Christ Jesus, one of being strangers and pilgrims. Look, we're looking for a better country. That is a heavenly, just, just in case there was any question about it. And we're looking for a city that has foundations, whose builder and makers got, but we're moving about. We're not looking for it here, we're looking for it here, but we're moving about here while we're looking here. Like others whom Jesus chose, he was not of the world. So they couldn't settle down. He was being directed. We are being directed by the Holy Spirit while we're walking about. The Holy Spirit is leading us. Jesus is teaching us while we're walking about, while we're surveying the land, while we're walking by faith and living by faith. Of course, if that's not the case, then you're not getting any additional information. So Abimelech, he was glad to hear he, there was a way he could live. I mean, this must have been a, must have been a piece of good news. Yeah. Here there was, a, there was a way he could live. So he gave Abraham some sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them to Abraham and restored Sarah, his wife. And he told Abraham, look, the land's before you. Look, it's almost the same thing that happened to Jacob. Remember when yeah. Jacob and his company went down and Pharaoh gave him, just pick, pick out the best spot. And that's what he said, just, this is the land's before you. Just pick, pick wherever you want to live. Yeah. Sojourn there. Okay, what Abraham said That's right. <laughs> it might not have been very much of the fear of the Lord when Abraham entered that place, but we see it's very evident there is now. That's <laughs> right. Oh, well, Amen. Yeah. <laughs> and so Abraham's growth, it, it, wealth grows. Now, actually, we have no idea if Abraham had belongings when he left error or not. We, it doesn't say. Just said he, he increased in wealth. When he got to, got to Haran, Abraham took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's sons, and all the substance they had gathered and the souls that had, got, that had gotten in Haran. So up before Haran, which is the first stop, we, we don't know how much he had, but he's picking up stuff as he's walking. He's picking up things. Remember after he, when he came to Canaan and there was a famine, he went down to Egypt and down in Egypt, Pharaoh entreated Abraham well for Sarah's sake and he had sheep and oxen and he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels and he gave her an increase of wealth again. Now in this episode it's increased again while he's on the move. He's increasing his wealth. Now you can see I'm sure the parallel to life in Christ. As you're moving along, moving upward, moving onward, you're increasing your possessions in Christ Jesus. You're filling your bag with things new and things old, getting more as you journey along. But at the point, you stop walking, you stop receiving. And the enemy can start taking away what you did have. 
Sarah is restored to Abraham, his wife. I wanted to say one other thing I omitted that when God appeared to Abimelech, he said that he Abimelech had sinned against him. God, did you catch that? Yeah. Sinned against God. So Sarah is restored. And Abram's given his choice of the land. And then it says, the last sentence says, and she was reproved. Sarah was reproved. And he said something much, much kind of cut her heart. He said, "Cut her heart." He said, "I've given th thy brother." And he knew Sarah was Abram's wife because God had told him she, he was. He was. But this is like a. <laughs> this must have been like a dagger in Sarah's heart. I've given unto thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. I don't know what they were for. There's a variety of explanations the commentators have given for what these were for. I don't know what they were for. But they were, uh, they were some kind of a token that Abimelech was admitting he did wrong. He was trying to write, do the best he could to write it. Wanted to make sure that everybody knew he made it right. Some versions says she was reproved. Some some say she was reproved or rebuked, and there's a number of versions that say that. Some say she was cleared of the charge. I don't know what the charge would be, but some say she was vindicated, proved to be innocent. Some say she was righted. Some say Sarah was to remember that she she was taken. That's what one version says. Just remember, Sarah, you were taken. And some say that was silenced any criticism against Sarah. Septuagint version and two other versions say, tell the truth from now on, Sarah. And Sarah's honor was preserved. A couple of versions said that. And Sarah was reasoned with, Young's literal, Young's literal translation. Justice has now been done, the Living Bible says. Sarah done nothing wrong, the contemporary English and Good News Bible says. Abimelech had done the right thing, English Revised Version says. And Sarah was compensated for the inconvenience caused her, the Living Bible says. You see, there's a lot of different <laughs> views as to what, <laughs> what that meant. That was all versions of she was reproved. Yeah. That's how these different versions. It's no wonder some people don't understand the Bible. I mean, I can understand. <laughs> and then I give you some people who've commented on it. For, you, for those who have been interested in that sort of thing. <clears throat> now my purpose is not just to tell you what other people said. There's a, there's a point I want to make of this. And here's, here's uh, four points, three points. The meaning to text cannot be settled by an appeal to the customs of the day. Now there's all kind of people do this. They account for texts that are very difficult to understand. They say, well, that was the custom. Well, this, this, this will not resolve a Bible text. To begin with, this text is written 500 years after it happened, which the custom may have changed. Second observation, an etymological approach is an approach based on language itself. Strictly based upon the rules of language is not a satisfactory approach to explaining the Bible. You may include this, you may buttress sound observations by it, but that can't be the basis for your teaching. It assumes exact parallel from, of the from and to language, which may not be true. And when lexical definitions are not in agreement, which often they are not, they cannot be the foundation upon which scriptural meaning is established. Now, some of our brethren have come from backgrounds that, where they actually did this. Now they would take, uh, for instance, the word baptize. And they'd say the meaning is immerse. And that's the meaning of the original word. And they'll base their doctrine on that. What's the meaning? Immerse is not an accurate meaning of the word. Because immerse leaves you under. 
But in baptism, it's coming up. That's the point, not the going down. And in the one denomination believes it's wrong to use an instrument of music. So they say the word solo, they base it on a lexical definition of a word that is really not found any place. So they base a doctrine on a dictionary definition. You, it just can't be done. If this is the only way to establish a doctrine, just don't quit preaching a doctrine. Find a better basis yeah, yeah. to preach it. As I say, if, they, if it agrees with truth, you might, it's not that it's wrong to make reference to these, but it's wrong to build yeah. on these sort of things. <laughs> And third, when men who are knowledgeable of a text in Scripture and the precision of language can't agree on the meaning of the text, then somebody's not thinking the same way. And I, why should you try and decide which one's right? Just find another way to determine the text. I'll give you what I understand the meaning to be. Sarah being reproved was her own view and Abimelech's view. See, that was, I could imagine if I was in Sarah's place that this would be like a reproof. And for Abimelech, I know it was a reproof. The king's reference to Abram as their brother appears to support this meaning that it was like, don't forget Sarah, your brother. There's also an apparent effort on the part of Abimelech to correct his error. That, that's obvious. He was trying to show that he was had integrity. There's also a provision to ensure that someone else in Gerar would not make the same mistake Abimelech made and take Sarah. See? So Abram could show these 20 pieces of silver. You see, you recognize these are from Abimelech. You know, lay off Sarah. And doubtless Abraham saw no more clearly that it was not needful to resort to this statement about Sarah being his sister. But also <coughs> in Scripture, there's something else to be seen here. Now, according to time, the time, this is the year before Isaac is going to be born. Isaac is going to be born the next year. If God had allowed Abimelech to touch it wouldn't have been known whether Isaac was Abimelech's son or Abraham's son. Right. See? Uh -huh. So God kept him from coming near her. She apparently she's very attractive. Kept her from coming, kept him from coming near her to preserve the integrity of his promise. Mm -hmm. That when she is born, there's no question this is Abraham's son. Amen. <laughs> then <coughs> Abraham prayed unto God. Yeah. I mentioned this is the first time. The word prayed is in the Bible. God told Abimelech like Abraham would pray for him. I don't know if God told Abraham pray for him. or I, I'm not sure how all this happened, but Abraham knew he should pray for him. He doesn't even say what he did pray for him. Probably prayed that God would heal him. Like that's what happened. Abraham, Abraham was in some way directed to do this, I'm sure, but I, don't, I can't have any other explanation than that. We have here an example of something that John talked about. It's very general here, but very specific. John said, if a man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, that is a sin not unto death, it's a sin that you don't die because you committed the sin. Like Uzzah died because he committed the sin. Ananias and Sapphira died because they committed the sin. Herod died because he committed the sin. See, if it's, if it's that kind of sin, no amount of prayer, you can't, you can't, prayer won't help. So I'm not saying about that, don't pray for that. He shall ask, if he sees his brother sin and sin, not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life. That's right. That's what, that's what Abimelech got. Mm -hmm. Life. <coughs> God, now notice how extensive this was. God healed Abimelech mm -hmm. and his wife and his maidservants. And they bear children. <coughs> so the men evidently were cursed some way too. Rendered impotent, so to speak. The Lord, it says, it closed fast the wombs of the house of Abimelech. No, none of the women could have children. They, they just, it just was impossible. Couldn't have it. 
Now this might suggest to some that Abram was in Gerar for some time. It, uh, I mean, I can't see the wounds being closed up fast for a week. I mean, it's, but it's kind of vague. Some people have said, well, this, this is a, it's a lot had taken place before that is not mentioned. I don't know, but it does suggest that there was, that Abraham was in that territory for a sufficient time for this situation to be corrected. It'd take a while to know that you could have children. I mean, it'd take a while and then to, to have some kind of sign that the child was being born, I gather it would have been at least some months, but that's some of the things aren't spelled out. But you can see how detailed God was and how all this that had to be worked out that we can't work it out, but see, God, He worked all that, Amen. all that out. And it said that He had closed up the wounds because of Sarah. Not because Sarah said, he's my brother. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but because Sarah was his chosen maid. She was a matron of the Lord. Yeah. She'd been chosen to give birth to the promised heir. And so God protected her. Mm -hmm. So there'd be no question about it. Amen. So this uh, confirms to me, at least, that God did not account this as a transgression on Sarah's part. Even though if you'd been living on this side of the cross, it would, that, that would have been, been a different matter. But she didn't. So God plagued Abimelech's house, <laughs> like he did Pharaoh's. He plagued Pharaoh's house, too, in Egypt. And so Isaac was born without any question about who was his father. Isn't that, isn't that good to know? Yeah. It's how particular God is about being known as a God of truth. He wants to be known as a God of truth because he is a God of truth. See, for this is why God tells his people, be holy. See, I'm holy, and if you're not holy, it suggests that I'm not holy. Be, see, God is very serious about how he is viewed and how his promises are viewed. And that was this whole thing was driven by God. It was a test to Abraham. And Abraham, remember we talked about the evaluation is not given until the test is passed. Yeah, yeah. So in Hebrews, he doesn't make reference to this. That's right. huh? <laughs> in Romans 4, where Paul mentions Abraham extensively, he doesn't make reference to this event. Yeah, right. Why? Because this was a trial. Mm -hmm. And Abraham eventually passed the trial and God worked it together for good Amen. to him. Amen. I think I'll close there. There's a lot, a lot in that text, isn't there? <laughs> Yes, Brother Ricky. God has said that He keeps covenant. Keep covenant. He had made a promise to Abraham that He would mm -hmm. bless all the families in the world. Yeah. And now we're seeing a family being blessed for Abraham's yeah, sake. That's right. It's mm -hmm. not that God has some particular care for heathen kings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He favored him because of Abraham. This, Amen. this was set up yeah. by God as a demonstration of yeah. His promise being kept. Yeah. Amen. Yes, but it's just a bar. At the beginning when you mentioned the Lord not speaking against these brethren of faith and men not having liberty to do so either, I was considering that these men, that people of our day particularly speak against the most common, <coughs> are the men that were most evidently joined to the Lord yeah. in that time. Yes. And that's, that's the reason why it's so dangerous to do so is because of this connection that they had with the Lord. If anyone speaks against them, that gives cause for reproach upon the Lord himself. Yes, amen. So I see it's a device of the wicked one targeting these ones that were most connected to the Lord that men want to speak so ill of. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yes, Brother Tony. We can, we can be sure, this account teaches us now, we can be sure that every, everything God is doing according to his purpose and according to what he wants to do is going to work for His blessing. That's right. Mm -hmm. And for our objective, though, is to make sure that we're involved in that so that we'll partake of His blessing and Amen. His goodness. Because mm -hmm. so you, can, you can be sure that everything that's involved in what He's doing is going to work to the good. Amen. So we want to be in, we want to be in the middle mm -hmm. of that. Amen. Amen. Well, Jane, you had something? Well, I just want to know that 
at the time this took place, Sarah's 89 years old. Yeah. <laughs> so much for our current generation's yes, emphasis and value of you. That's right. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Abraham married my young woman younger than himself. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 89 and 99. This powerful oh, man yeah. wants it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Sister Annie? I consider when you say God directs you and you begin to make progress. When you're on the scavenger hunt, as you continue on, there's little clues that direct you to where the treasure is. But if you just sit down and you don't walk or yeah. walk towards where you're told to go, you're never going to find any clues and you'll never That's find right. You. Mm -hmm. you got it, honey. You yeah. got it. That's it. <laughs> Brother you Jimmy, uh, as Brother Tony was talking also, I was thinking about yeah. how you can also see through this that a lot of times people get um, kind of anxious and worked up in their own little life, but if you see the, the big picture that how God's working everything out and that he's... It, Whatever we're doing is is fitting into a part of a, a broader thing. That's right. That God's putting it all together, and this really, to me, uh, helps you to see that if you seek Him, everything else will be taken yeah. care of. Amen. Amen. That, I mean, and that takes a lot of pressure off of Amen. you. Amen. If you're able to see it. Amen. <laughs> Is it them? Um, I was thinking about this is not the only account that we have of when a heathen king yeah. has seen the glory of God. That's uh -huh. right. And yeah. it, just, it, it just astonishes me, though, in our day that people yeah. don't have a fear of God. That's right. Yeah. You're right. It's like mm -hmm. they could see it. And they could see it. We should be able to. See that's that right. With, with a lot less than we have. Yeah. 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 Wow. Wow. That whole household were afraid. Boy, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. It's a callous time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yes, sir, did you do it? Yeah, we uh, had talked in time past about um, how that there was an attempt to thwart the purpose of God uh, through the barrenness of Sarah. <coughs> how God used that mm. to, to show that the birth was of His design. Yes, amen. But also this heathen king. To see see another perhaps attempt to uh, defile the line, mm -hmm. and yet the events of this, the way they worked out, they testified that that God was able to keep her and Abraham mm. pure to His purpose, mm. and that this justified. I mean, it, it was like an evident witness that that, <coughs> that had not taken place. Mm -hmm. That this there was no question that there were that Isaac was the issue only of Abraham mm -hmm. and Sarah. Amen. Mm -hmm. So there, you had something? Uh, Abimelech wasn't a Jew, so he, he didn't have the, the same uh, grooming in the knowledge of God, in the working of God as Abraham did in Lot. Mm -hmm. But it, it strikes it's striking to me in this account that God speaks to Abimelech and Abimelech just responds. That's right. As Amen. If it's a, it's a just a normal dialogue mm -hmm. uh, between acquaintances or something, which makes me think that the Lord didn't thunder out of heaven in such a way that make you know, in a, like at other times when people knew that they were in the presence of God, they became as dead men, and so it was it was some sort of veiled uh, yeah. dialogue. Yeah between him and Abimelech, but it, 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 it occurred to me that this is uh, one evidence uh, or an example of Romans 2, uh, yes, the, right. con the conscience else defending or accusing yes. uh, them. So he Abimelech had a conscience toward God, and that's uh, or a, con a conscience, I, I guess I should say, mm -hmm. because he was made in the image of God, and that's what God appealed to. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. That's what he appealed to. That's why he said it the way he said it. Yes, that's good. Well, Beth said that he hadn't broken his integrity, mm -hmm. that his, he, he hadn't done anything that was willfully wrong mm -hmm. or yeah. knowingly wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when he said that uh, it rose up early in the morning, I was thinking about that. I get the idea that he didn't go back to sleep. <laughs> that's what it sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Brother Ricky? I was thinking when Jesus 
set of the scriptures, he said, these are they which are written of me. Anyone talking about the New Testament? He's talking about Genesis. That's right. The Malachi. And here God is already developing our idea of God approaching men through his favor toward another man. Mm -hmm. Yes. Amen. Like is being Amen. Favor for Abraham's sake. So here, right out of the chute, we see God already culturing men to yeah. think in terms of this. So that when the time comes for Jesus to call out, labor not for the meat that perishes, but for the meat that endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give you. For upon him God has placed his seal of approval. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Men would be ready to receive That's something right. like that. Yeah. Amen. 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 Sister Mariah? I'm, I was thinking about what you were saying when you said the focus of the revelation in the early scriptures was God himself. I'm, I'm thinking if you take God out of the picture of this whole thing, then everything else collapses. God must be the center or else... Or else everything else has to be known. That's right. Amen. It's a good example, this lesson, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Of that very thing. That's right. Yes, Sister I was Michelle. Considering how in Abraham's dealing with Abimelech, it wasn't just because of fear of Abimelech, he was considering the promise of the Lord the whole time. That's right. Isaac had not been, or the promise he had not been born yet, and so knowing that something could happen, he was working all things out, knowing that the Lord will fulfill His promise, He just didn't know how it would happen at that time. So in considering Abraham and the circumstances around there, he had been considering the promise for many, many years up to this point, and so he, he wouldn't forget it just because of a circumstance mm -hmm. that came upon him. Amen. Yes, sister. I was also considering this uh, point about Sarah being reproved, um, or... Uh, she was bought, so to speak. I was thinking of how Christ bought us back. That's right. Um, and how it says that He is to thee a covering. <laughs> so I was looking into that. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot in that to go with uh, how Christ paid the price for us. Yes. Amen. <coughs> Amen. So I'm thinking of the end. So Abraham prayed unto God for Abimelech. I thought of the text that says, The prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And God favored Abraham, and it says in the text that God healed Abimelech, his wife, and his maidservants. So th this is the prayer of Amen. much. Amen. 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 Mm -hmm. Mike? I remember several, a few years ago, you and I were discussing this passage of how uh, Abimelech had, out of his mouth, he was saying one thing, but he was doing another. He was he was giving gifts and he was rebuking them with his mouth, but he was giving yes. giving gifts to Abraham and Sarah. And I remember you made the comment, Yeah, rebuke me some more. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I thought <coughs> these instances in scriptures in the scripture seem to be like a test to see who men are listening to, whether they they oh, listen good. to God's assessment yeah. Yeah. or man's assessment. God God made it very clear what he thought of the situation, mm -hmm. but now these days people listen to Abimelech. Mm -hmm. Maybe you have the same situation with uh, what the men of Sodom said about Lot and mm -hmm. what the Holy Spirit said about Lot, yeah. or what Esau said about Jacob, uh -huh. or what God said about Jacob. Mm -hmm. And men, just some men, just ignore what God has said. It's right there in the Bible. That's right. And mm -hmm. they choose to listen to Abimelech instead. Mm -hmm. That would be a good survey or series. You read it, though? Go through the scripture and find out <laughs> those places where God said certain things about certain people. Mm -hmm. Vindication of the saints. Yeah, yeah. It'd be a good series, wouldn't it? <laughs> All right, we'll have a word of prayer. <laughs> Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Word of God and for the many things that are revealed in it. We thank you for establishing the way you want us to think about certain men of Scripture. And we realize that in Christ that you have established how we're to think of one another in Christ Jesus. And we pray that we... You give us grace to pursue being more perfect in this regard, always assessing people as you have assessed them, whatever that assessment may be, and not trying to establish ourselves as the uh, official's evaluator of people and things. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.